Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. I would like to, to welcome all students who thankfully join this lecture. For optimum use of time, I kindly request you to keep your comments and questions after the presentation. If you have urgent comment, please raise hands. And you can find this lecture and others on my YouTube channel named Professor Abdul Salam Yassin Taha by, visit, by visiting this link. So from Suleimaniya, the beautiful city of Kurdistan region, Iraq, we present our topic today. What to do for pectus excavatum? In this lecture, we wish to discuss uh, description, incidence, and etiology of pectus excavatum, clinical representation, radiographic assessment, treatment modalities, history of pectus excavatum surgery, rationale for minimally invasive repair of pectus excavatum, the so-called NAS repair, indications and diagnostic workup, technique of modified NAS repair and the technique of bar removal, results and complications, and we may see a surgical video demonstrating the procedure. And at the end of the lecture, we'll take home messages and show our list of bibliography. So pectus excavatum is the most common type of congenital chest wall abnormality, accounting for 90% of the cases followed by pectus carinatum, which accounts for five to seven percent of the cases. Pectus excavatum occurs in an estimated one in a 300 to 400 births, with a male to female ratio of three to one. The condition is typically noticed at birth, and more than 90 percent of cases are diagnosed within the first year of life. Pectus excavatum, also known as funnel chest, is characterized by concavity of the sternum and costal cartilage. The exact mechanism of this abnormal growth of bone and cartilage is unknown. Weakness of the parasternal cartilage due to a metabolic disorder is suspected. Family history is positive in up to 35% of the cases, and the association of pectus excavatum with Marfan's and or pollen syndrome is well known. The symptoms produced by the anomaly, beside the unsightly appearance of the deformity and its negative impact on psychology of the patient, it can present with shortness of breath, reduced exercise tolerance, palpitation, and others. The basis for these symptoms is a 
compression of the heart and the lungs. So patients with a severe degree of pectus excavatum have right-sided cardiac compression, decreased filling, and decreased stroke volume. The degree of pulmonary restriction and obstruction is related to the degree of deformity and degree of cardiac displacement into the left chest. So this is an example of a male patient with a severe uh, pectus excavatum deformity. And this is an example of a female, 28 years old, with severe pectus excavatum deformity. The deformity can be symmetric or asymmetric. It can be sometimes associated with pectus carinatum. And this is an example of a young infant with pectus excavatum. There are many imaging modalities used to assess or evaluate the anomaly. Most importantly is a CT scan of the chest. So the severity of the pectus anomaly uh, can be measured by the Haller index calculated by dividing the transverse diameter of the chest over the anteroposterior diameter. Severe pectus excavatum exists when this ratio exceeds 3.25 as the normal value is 2.56. There are many treatment options. To start with, we discuss the non-operative treatment, which is usually suitable for mild to moderate pectus excavatum. The non-operative treatment consists of a deep breathing with a breath holding exercise, postural uh, or postural exercise, exercise program, and the vacuum bell. The vacuum bell that you see in, this, in these pictures acts as a suction cup that lifts the sunken chest. Vacuum bell therapy slowly corrects the pectus excavatum. For the therapy to be successful, the patient needs to wear the vacuum bell over a long period of time, about one to two years. And the therapy is best for younger patients with a mild pectus excavatum deformity. The uh, vacuum bell can be used also uh, prior to NAS procedure as a method to lift the sternum and to facilitate the dissection in the anterior mediastinum also. There are many surgical procedures uh, performed for pectus excavatum. The implantation of soft silicone solid implants uh, subcutaneously is actually a method to conceal rather than to correct the anomaly. WADA procedure or sternal turnover operation is an operative technique introduced for the first time by Dr. J. WADA of Japan in 1965 but no, no more in use today due to the extensive dissection and radical nature of the operation. So in this operation, dissection uh, is, is made to uh, isolate the sternum and divide the costal cartilage and divide all the costal 
all the external attachments. So the sternocostal uh, uh, segment will act as a graft, which will be turned, and that's why it's called sternal uh, turnover operation. The operation at its time yielded some success, but as we said, because of the extensive dissection, uh, it was abandoned and no more uh, in use uh, today. Ravage procedure introduced by Dr. Mark M. Ravage, who was born in 1910 and died at 1989. We have discussed this procedure in a previous uh, video lecture. In 1949, Ravage recommended complete resection of the coastal cartilage and complete mobilization of the sternum with and without, with or without external uh, traction. By 1958, Welch and at Boston Children's Hospital advocated a less radical approach, preserving the intercoastal bundles. And in 1961, Atkins and Blades passed a straight stainless steel bar behind the sternum. This form of pectus repair, the so-called modified ravage procedure, became the established technique for patients of all ages for the next 40 years. So average procedure was universally accepted by surgeons as the standard treatment for pectus excavatum and several studies were published revealing acceptable results and a low complication rate Dr. Donald Nuss, the pioneer of Nuss procedure, uh, states, why did Ravage procedure prevail over all other techniques? Dr. Nuss answers the question, because Ravage and Welsh wrote all the chapters on pectus excavatum in the pediatrics and thoracic textbooks for 40 years, so that is uh, the explanation why the operation persisted for this long period, despite its complications. Even though, despite the use of ravage operation for more than 40 years, the wide resection performed in ravage procedure resulted actually in a very rigid anterior chest wall and in some cases, the development of a complication called asphyxiating chondral dystrophy. Therefore, the primary care physicians became reluctant to refer their patients for this type of repair. And it's the time to think of a new treatment for pectus excavatum. Known as Nuss bar repair. Quoting from Dr. Nuss, uh, shortly thereafter, while doing a ravage repair, one of the rib cartilages bent to a 90 degree while removing it. And I, the talk is to uh, Dr. Donald Nuss, and I heard a voice saying, why are you removing it? Cannot you see how flexible it is? This caused me to reevaluate my options. In 1987, Nuss developed a minimally invasive technique to repair pectus excavatum. A convex steel bar was inserted under the sternum through small bilateral thoracic incisions 
actually at that operation, the initial operation, the incision was an anterior chest wall uh, incision. The steel bar was inserted with the convexity facing posteriorly. And when it was in position, the bar was turned over, uh, thereby correcting the deformity. So, what was the story of the first patient of NAS uh, repair? When in 1987, a seven-year-old male patient presented with a severe pectus excavatum, Dr. Donald Nuss discussed with the parents the option of not removing the chest wall structures. They allowed him to proceed with his proposed surgical solution, which included placing a bar under the sternum without cartilage resection or sternal osteotomy. The procedure was uneventful and gave an excellent correction. Now, what are the rationale for NAS procedure? Uh, according to uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Donald uh, Nuss, children have soft and malleable chest. Number two, even middle-aged and older adults develop a barrel-shaped chest configuration in response to COPD, such as emphysema. If older adults are able to configure the chest wall children and teenagers should be able to do the same given the increased malleability of their anterior chest wall. Number three, uh, the role of braces and serial casting in successfully correcting skeletal anomalies such as scoliosis, club foot, and maxillomandibular malocclusion by orthopedic and orthodontic uh, surgeons is well established. The anterior chest wall being even more malleable than the previously mentioned skeletal structures is therefore ideal for this type of correction. So to many surgeons, this less invasive procedure is analogous to applying braces to the teeth to straighten them out rather than removing them. So, uh, in 1998, Nas et al. published their initial 10-year experience with this minimally invasive uh, repair of pectus excavatum. 42 patients with pectus excavatum all of them under the age of 15, received the procedure. After two years, when permanent remolding has occurred, the bar was removed in an outpatient procedure. Results were excellent in 73.3%, good in 13.3%, fair in 6.7%, and poor in just 6.7% percent of the cases. The method was considered effective. Excellent long-term results were obtained since the authors started to increase the strength of the bar. Initially, the bar was titanium. Then they changed the bar into stainless steel and inserted two bars where necessary. So some patients with severe deformity required inserting more than uh, a single bar, and this gave a better result. And uh, after this publication, the new procedure became widely accepted, and a flood of new patients suddenly started to appear, which allowed for rapid improvements and modifications of the technique. That is Dr. Uh, Donald Nuss, the pioneer of Nuss procedure. 
Dr. Nuss and his colleagues have developed an annual international workshop at Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters in Norfolk, Virginia, and taught the procedure to more than 100 surgeons so far. That is Children's Hospital of the King's Daughter, of the King's Daughters, at which the operation was done for the first time and still uh, being taught uh, to surgeons from different regions of the world. Well, after the original NAS procedure, many modifications uh, were uh, added. Uh, several key innova innovations were developed in the following two decades. The first one was to strengthen the bar as the original one was, wasn't strong enough to provide a durable correction. Multiple bars were used in large patients or those with more severe deformity. The bar was completely redesigned and new instruments were designed and developed specifically for the minimally invasive repair of pectus excavatum. Allergy testing was implemented to uh, 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 discover whether the patients are allergic to the metal uh, of the bar. The incision was moved from the anterior chest wall to bilateral uh, lateral chest wall incisions. Other important additions included the use of thoracoscopy in 1998, which made the substernal dissection safer and helped optimize bar placement. A stabilizer was developed in 1998 to improve bar fixation. Addition of pericostal sutures in 2002 reduced bar displacement to less than 1% when combined with a stabilizer. Park has also developed several new devices such as claw fixator and hinge plate to help prevent bar displacement. Later, Sternal elevation prior to substernal dissection was developed and found to be facilitated by using a variety of retractors, towel clamps, club suction cup, or Parks crane technique. Protocols were developed for selecting patients who were severe enough to warrant surgery. Other protocols were developed for non-operative treatment, pain management, and post-operative management. So currently, the indications for NAS repair includes two or more of the following criteria. Number one, symptomatic patient. Two, moderate to severe pectus excavatum deformity, symmetric or asymmetric on physical examination, severe pectus with a hollow index more than 3.25, restrictive or obstructive pattern and respiratory function test, rhythm disturbance and or mitral valve prolapse, cardiac compression or displacement, documentation of a progression of the deformity, uh, poor body image and psychosocial maladjustment, and if the patient uh, fulfills two or more of these criteria, uh, he or she will be a candidate for surgery, a comprehensive preoperative evaluation including cardiology consultation and echocardiography, 
must be completed in order to determine the patient's level of risk prior to the procedure. So the following pictures will show the, uh, the procedure of NAS repair uh, in, in, in steps. The chest is marked before starting uh, surgery. The deepest uh, point of, of the depression is marked with a circle. The bilateral uh, incision sites are marked with uh, straight lines. And the thoracic entry and exit sites are marked with an X, all of which are in the same horizontal plane. The length of the bar is determined by measuring the distance between the two uh, mid axillary lines and subtracting 2.5 centimeters from that measurement. The thoracoscope is inserted in the right mid axillary line, approximately two intercostal spaces inferior to the incision site, and the thoracoscope is directed superiorly to avoid injuring of the diaphragm. The addition of thoracoscope uh, uh, is very important to uh, guide the introducer and the bar and minimize the complications. Uh, the figure A shows the uh, substernal transthoracic introducer, which is uh, used uh, to uh, make a tunnel uh, uh, retrosternally. So in order to minimize the risk of cardiac and pulmonary laceration during dissection, sternal elevation should be accomplished prior to creating the uh, substernal tunnel by means of one of several external elevation techniques. So by practice, uh, the uh, uh, Dr. Noss and his colleagues observed that in order to make the uh, insertion of the introducer uh, safer, uh, they thought of using uh, techniques to elevate the sternum to reduce the uh, risk of sub-external uh, dissection. So here in B, you can see a sternal elevation using the vacuum bell to facilitate the mediastinal uh, dissection in young patients with a malleable chest wall. And in C here, you can see sternal elevation with a hook inserted through a small sub incision and in D, you can see a sternal elevation using the crane technique in which a wire is passed through the anterior table of the sternum and attached to a Thompson retractor to elevate the sternum. Here you can see the passage of the uh, introducer. The uh, introducer is inserted first of all, through the subcutaneous tunnel under the pectoralis major muscle before entering the thoracic cavity as the previously marked X. In B, you can see the introducer passing immediately under the sternum with the tip always in view. And in C, you can see the introducer have been passed and emerged from the thorax through the left intercostal uh, space marked with an X uh, uh, and behind the left pectoralis uh, major muscle. After that, a tip is uh, introduced through an opening at the tip of the introducer. Uh, well, the introducer itself uh, uh, can be used uh, to elevate the sternum and to correct the, uh, uh, the, uh, the abnormality. Uh, 
So here, the introducer uh, is lifted uh, uh, upwards in order to correct the deformity, loosen up the anterior chest wall, and stretch the ligaments. And this greatly facilitates the bar rotation and decreases the pressure on the bar and minimizes the bar displacement. This maneuver should be repeated several times. After that, after the chest wall elevation procedure, umbilical tape is attached to the introducer, which is then slowly withdrawn from the chest cavity under thoracoscopic uh, guidance. When the introducer uh, is out of the chest, the uh, tape uh, is cut off and attached to the uh, uh, pectus bar, and the pectus bar is uh, slowly uh, introduced through the mediastinal tunnel with the convexity facing posteriorly under thoracoscopic control. Now, when the bar uh, has been passed, it should be rotated 180 degrees by using uh, a, a special instrument called bar flipper. And here, the bar has been rotated 180 degrees, and it, it's, it's in its position, and the deformity has been corrected. To minimize the chance of bar displacement, a stabilizer is uh, connected to the left side of the bar, and the stabilizer is sutured to the, uh, uh, to the, to the bar and also to the uh, fascia of the muscles uh, by uh, sutures. And on the right side, multiple pericostal uh, sutures are used to fix the bar into the ribs and minimize the chance of bar displacement. And finally, the air uh, uh, in the thoracic cavity should be uh, evacuated by cutting the uh, insufflation tube and putting the end of the insufflation tube uh, under the level of uh, fluid and ask the anesthesiologist to inflate the lung uh, so that the uh, bubbles of air uh, are ev evacuated completely. And after that, the wounds are sutured. So this is uh, 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 the procedure in steps. And this is a picture of a pectus excavatum in a 12-year-old boy. And the same boy uh, uh, has been uh, operated upon by uh, this technique, the uh, NAS procedure. Two weeks later, uh, the picture shows 100% correction of his uh, anomaly. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nuss has uh, published an important paper in 2016 called uh, Nuss Bar Procedure Past, Present, and Future. Uh, it is a very uh, uh, nice and interesting paper. In this paper, Dr. Nuss uh, uh, published the results of his uh, procedure performed over 1,385 patients. In the early results, excellent result was obtained in 90.5%, good result in 7.8%, fair result in 0.5%, poor result in 0.4%, uh, failed result in 0.8%. The uh, complications in the early post-operative period included a pneumothorax in 3.8%, drug reaction in 2.9%, uh, suture site infection in 1.9%, pneumonia in 0.9%, full effusion in 0.9%, pericarditis in 0.6%, hemothorax in 0.3%, temporary paralysis in 0.1%, and uh, cardiac perforation and death, uh, 0%. Bar removal 
is scheduled to be performed uh, between two on, and four years after the operation. It is done as an outpatient procedure under general anesthesia and under ECG monitoring. You can see here the stabilizer should be removed first and the bar is withdrawn uh, carefully with ECG monitoring. Uh, and after that, the wounds are closed and the patient uh, is discharged home the same, the same day. So the take home messages of our lecture, uh, since its first uh, invention in 1987, this procedure has become the standard therapy in children with pectus excavatum. Subsequent modifications allowed this procedure to be performed safely and effectively in late adolescent and adult patients with pectus excavatum. Despite the plenty of advantages and excellent results of this procedure, meticulous technique and attention to details are necessary to avoid complications. Uh, Post-operative pain control is vital. Routine activities are gradually permitted as the pain, as the pain decreases. Although patients are discharged home early after this procedure, Regular follow-up is crucial. And remember that ravage procedure may still be needed sometimes. For example, in patients with combined pectus excavatum and pectus carinatum deformity. And this is the list of bibliography that we have used in preparing in this lecture. Actually, uh, we used uh, journal articles as well as a uh, surgical video. Uh, some of, the, uh, of these articles were published by Dr. Uh, uh, Donald Nuss himself, and they are very interesting, and they cover the past, present, and future of this procedure. 